Hi, my name is Mark Adams. Before I start telling my sad story, I would like to tell you a little about myself and my ex-wife, Jennifer. I'm 5'10 inches tall and weigh 180 pounds. I am in good physical shape. Every morning, if work allows, I run two laps in the park. I swim a couple miles every week and go to a traditional gym twice a week to lift weights and work out with an MMA instructor. I'm no Bruce Lee, but I can hold my own, so 180 pounds is mostly muscle. People tell me I look a little like George Clooney. I have a master's degree in computer technology, a postgraduate degree in business management, and a bachelor's degree in economics. I received them from Oxford University in England because my father worked as a translator for the U.S. Embassy. After completing his tour of duty, my father returned to the United States, and I stayed behind to complete my education. I own and operate my own computer repair business. I'm also working on a new core program that covers a wide range of applications from games to military programs. A key component of this program is the ability to automatically solve problems in real time. It should be ready within six months to a year. I have a younger sister, two years younger than me, Patricia, known as Patipat. I love my sister and she adores me. We have no secrets from each other. We tell each other everything. She currently works as an associate at a prestigious law firm in New York State. My ex-wife Jennifer is 5'3", 110 pounds. She stays fit by going to the gym at least four times a week. She has the face of an angel and her smile lights up the room. She has a stunning figure with a 34B bust, 22-inch waist and 33-inch hips, red hair and green eyes, and a fiery temper. She has a law degree and works as a corporate lawyer at Zaisi, a public relations and advertising agency. Jennifer and I first met at Patty's graduation ceremony. Patty and Jennifer's sister Amy shared a dorm room, and they introduced us to each other at our graduation party. It turned out that we live in the same medium-sized town, only three miles apart. We immediately hit it off and started dating, and six months later we got married. She started working at Zai's as a junior associate, earning just over five figures plus bonuses. I took a job compiling and decompiling code for ABC flight controllers, earning an average of five figures plus bonuses. We lived in a good area, in a three-room house that my grandparents left me. My sister received a lump sum as her inheritance. Jennifer's parents and her sister lived in New York, and my parents moved to Florida after they retired. We had family gatherings about twice a year at Thanksgiving and Christmas, alternating locations. We were happy. We had a good income, good cars, and we went on vacation twice a year. Life was wonderful. Two years later, Jennifer was promoted to junior partner and things began to change. She started working late and went out with the girls on Fridays a couple of times a month. Of course, I started to suspect something was wrong and did the usual things checked her underwear, read her emails, and even installed a keylogger on her laptop. Yes, I know, I'm paranoid, but even if you're paranoid, that doesn't mean you're not being hunted. I even followed her on one of these nights, but I didn't notice anything suspicious, she didn't even dance with other men. So why did I still feel like something was wrong in our marriage? Jennifer was happy with her job and wanted to become a senior partner before we had children, which would take about another five years. I was disappointed with my work and saw no prospects for promotion. It was a family business and only family members were promoted, even if they were dumb as a plug. Then I decided to open my own computer repair business. I'm not talking about the type of business where you take your laptop to a store for repairs. I have worked exclusively with companies looking to modernize their systems and provide them with better security protocols. I did a business analysis before making this decision and predicted a slow start. But in a year, I would be making more money than I am now. I sat down with Jennifer to explain that the next year will be challenging, but all the forecasts say we will be better off in the long run. I didn't tell her about the new program I was working on because I didn't want to complicate things. She was categorically against it, saying why risk everything when we are already doing well? That is, everything was fine with her, but my job was at a dead end. Jennifer and I always kept our finances separate, with the exception of a joint account from which all bills were paid. 
each of us contributed an amount equivalent to half of our monthly expenses and kept the rest for ourselves. I quit my job and started my new business, funding it from my savings and taking out a loan against my home. I rented a small workshop with an office and began advertising my services and calling potential clients. After three months, I was already self-sufficient and was quite satisfied. Work on the new program was also progressing well. But one evening, Jennifer surprised me with the news. She said she was three months pregnant and we were having twins. Since I'm paranoid by nature, I looked at the calendar and guess what? At the time of the alleged conception, she was on a business trip to Miami for a week working with an important client. Right then I realized that she was cheating on me and decided that I would get a DNA test as soon as possible. As soon as she found out she was pregnant, she stopped sex completely, at least with me, saying she was afraid for the baby. I explained to her that she was too worried and even brought a doctor to tell her the same thing, but she was adamant that I had to spend at least six months without sex. We did all the usual things. I took her to relaxation classes, rubbed oil on her growing belly to reduce stretch marks, massaged her legs every night, and tolerated her increasingly bad mood. Meanwhile, my business began to generate income. I hired another computer scientist, Greg, fresh out of college, and hired a secretary named May. I never discussed my affairs with Jennifer as she seemed to have no interest in them. I was at a client's house one afternoon discussing upgrading their servers when I got a call. Labor has started, come immediately. I explained the situation to the client, and he understood everything and wished me good luck. I had been prepared for this moment for weeks, and I lived close to home so Jennifer didn't need to call an ambulance. When I arrived home, I saw that Jennifer was already waiting for me with her bag packed. I put her in the car, took her bag and DNA kit, and took her to the hospital. When the doctor examined her, he said there was still time before giving birth, and Jennifer was placed in a maternity ward with a separate room. Despite my suspicions about the twins' paternity, I was still excited about the prospect of becoming a father. The doctor said it would take some time and suggested that I go home, eat, and come back a little later. I arrived home all excited, ate, sat down and waited, but soon fell asleep. The phone rang. It was the hospital. They said that Jennifer was fully dilated. Contractions were every seven minutes. The baby was about to come. I grabbed my coat. It was 2.30 a.m. and rushed to the car. I arrived at the hospital in record time. The nurse took me into the delivery room. My wife lay moaning, legs in stirrups, and the doctor examined her. He looked at me. Just in time. I watched as the first baby was born, and a few minutes later the second arrived. The nurse took them and cleaned them, making sure they had all their fingers and toes. She then went to help clean up my wife, and while her back was turned, I took DNA samples from each of the children for a test. I desperately hoped they were mine, as I already felt a connection to them, but I needed to be sure. I walked up to Jennifer, kissed her tenderly, and she looked at me with sadness in her eyes and said that she loved me. I was asked to leave as Jennifer had been moved to the recovery room so she could rest. The next day I called everyone to tell them the good news. The grandparents were delighted and couldn't wait to meet their grandchildren. Patty and Amy said they would try to take time off to see their nephews. On the way to the hospital I bought a huge bouquet of flowers for Jennifer, and on the way I left a DNA kit and was told that the result would be ready in 10 days. The doctor said that Jennifer would remain in the hospital because, due to her small size, there was a rupture and she would need time to heal. I visited her every day for the next five days, but she seemed distracted and taciturn. I asked the doctor about this, and he said that this happens sometimes, but it will pass. When I visited Jennifer on Friday, the doctor said she would be discharged on Saturday afternoon. I had already prepared the nursery for our newborns and was counting down the hours until I could take them home. On Saturday morning I made sure the cots were securely set up and everything was ready for their return. At 1.30 p.m. I went to the hospital to pick up my family. I went straight to her room, but it was empty. I asked the nurse where my wife and children were, and she told me that another man had taken them. I asked who it was, but they couldn't tell me.
I called Jen's cell phone but couldn't get through. The head nurse heard the noise, came over, found out what was going on, and called security, who called the police. When the police arrived a man and a woman, both detectives, they took them into the security room to review the morning's CCTV footage. When they came back, they said it looked like Jen left with the man voluntarily, but they would still check because they recognized the man but wouldn't tell me who he was. They advised me to go home and promised to keep me informed of events. I sat at home, feeling nauseous and waiting for news. Around six in the evening, there was a knock on the door. I looked through the peephole and saw the same two detectives. I let them in, noticing that neither of them looked me in the eye. I asked what was going on, and the woman spoke first. Mr. Adams, we went to see your wife, and she and the children are completely safe, but we cannot tell you where they are. I'm really sorry. I don't understand. Where is my family, and why isn't Jen answering my calls? What's happening? Then the male detective spoke up. I'm very sorry to tell you this, but your wife left you and took the children with her. She asked me to tell you that her lawyer will contact you soon. Sorry again. Please don't do anything stupid until you hear from her. I wouldn't want to arrest you. Then they left and I was left alone. I felt empty inside and wanted to throw up. My hands were shaking and I started crying. My emptiness was complete. I had reached rock bottom. I woke up Sunday morning crying myself to sleep. I got up, showered, got dressed, and made breakfast, all on autopilot. After breakfast I felt a little better and called Jen's parents, maybe they knew something. Her father answered the phone, excitedly saying that they were coming to visit us the following weekend. I stopped him and explained what happened. He couldn't believe Jen would do something like that and said he would call her and call me back. It was almost lunchtime, so I went to Denny's and ordered a very unhealthy meal. A mega burger, fries with onion rings, and a beer. Feeling a little better, I returned home and checked to see if there were any messages on my answering machine, but there was nothing. I turned on the TV, but didn't watch much, but rather replayed the events of the last few days in my head, trying to find meaning in them. Finally, I gave up and looked at the clock. It was already past midnight and I went to bed. I didn't sleep well, my mind wouldn't calm down, so at six in the morning I gave up and got up, showered and went downstairs to have breakfast. I sat, watched the news on TV, and thought about what to do next. I was still sitting when the phone rang. It was Jen's lawyer who asked if I could come to a meeting later that day. We agreed on two o'clock in the afternoon, and he hung up. Maybe now I'll get answers. I arrived at his office and was immediately invited inside. I only expected to see her lawyer, but sitting on the couch was my wife and her boss, Carl Prescott. I wanted answers, but I didn't speak first, I just sat and waited. This seemed to unnerve everyone, just as I had hoped. The lawyer spoke first. Mr. Adams, I invited you here to discuss the terms of your divorce from Mrs. Jennifer Adams. I have a proposal from your wife and Mr. Prescott. In short, they propose that she divorce you due to irreconcilable differences. You keep the house, your pension, all your savings, and you keep the business. She does the same, but in addition you sign a document allowing Mr. Prescott to adopt your children. In exchange, Mr. Prescott will deposit $2 million into an account of your choice. I almost knocked over the table when I stood up. No way in the world. My children are not for sale for any money. Take this cheater for nothing. I don't want anything to do with her, so go to hell. Jen stood up and spoke in a conciliatory tone. Listen, Mark, I never meant to hurt you, but I know I did, and for that I sincerely apologize. I've been dating Carl for a while now, and we love each other very much and want to get married. Unfortunately, Carl can't have children, so he wants to adopt ours. The children will have everything they could want, a beautiful home to grow up in, a better education, and a great start in life. What can you offer? An old, inherited house and a stupid computer repair shop. Why do you think I want to leave? You are a loser with no ambition and no money. At least give the kids a chance. If you don't sign, I'll drive you into a corner. I'll take your house, half your income in child support, half your savings, your pension, your business, 
and I'll make sure you never see your children again. So you are in a hopeless situation, at least in our version, you will at least get something. Fuck you, Jen. First of all, the house belongs only to me. You have no rights to it. I have almost no savings, so half of nothing is still nothing. You earn more than me, so alimony will be minimal. I will happily pay child support for my children, even if I only see them every other week. As for my business, it won't exist without me. And just for your information, I don't have a pension fund for you to take away. See you in court. I stood up and walked away, leaving behind three confused people. I immediately drove to Denny's and ordered dinner and beer, and after dinner I drove home to a cold and empty house. I sat down with a beer in front of the TV, still angry. At about 11 o'clock in the evening, there was a knock on the door. I woke up from a knock and was still a little sleepy, so I didn't check the peephole before opening the door. When I opened the door, it was pushed sharply so that I staggered, but was able to stay on my feet. Three men rushed into the room and tried to grab me, but I was already fully awake, and the first one was punched in the throat and fell. The second one grabbed me by the neck and tried to throw me to the floor. While I was trying to free myself, the third one hit me in the shin with a baseball bat, and I fell. The first one was still lying on the floor, gasping for breath, and the other two started kicking me, and I began to lose consciousness. Before I passed out, I thought that I was going to die, and that I needed to leave some evidence to the police. The leader of the trio pulled me to my feet and said, Be smart and sign these damn papers, otherwise we'll be back. I slid down the wall, starting to lose consciousness, but his blows to the ribs brought me back to my senses, and I passed out. I regained consciousness slowly, hearing voices, but could not understand who they belonged to. I saw vague figures in the room, but could not distinguish them, then it became dark again. The next time I woke up, bright sunlight was shining through the window. I looked around the room and saw a woman sitting in a chair reading a book. It took a moment before I recognized her as Cam, the wife of my MMA instructor, Phil Wright. I tried to speak, but my mouth was too dry and I just croaked. Cam looked up and walked over to me, pressing the nurse call button. The nurse came in, checked my vital signs and smiled. She then asked how I was feeling and I croaked in response. She went out briefly and came back with ice pieces for me to suck on. I swear they tasted better than the best whiskey. Cam was holding my hand with one hand and calling someone with the other. I'm glad you're alive again, Mark. You scared us a lot. How are you feeling? It's like I was hit by a truck. The truck probably would have caused less damage. At that moment, the doctor entered the room. Glad to see you're finally awake. You were in a coma for three days, but I think you're on the road to recovery now. Do you think you can eat something? Doc, I would eat a whole cow. Just give it to me without the horns and wipe its ass. Everyone thought it was quite funny, but when I tried to laugh with them, my chest and side hurt so much that I almost passed out. The doctor adjusted my painkillers and showed me how to press the button to get more morphine, then left, saying he would be back soon. I lay there in a semi-morphine state for what seemed like hours, but a little over an hour had passed when Phil walked in. Phil told me what happened. I was attacked in my home, and a neighborhood watch patrol noticed my front door was open and decided to check, finding me lying in a pool of blood. They called an ambulance and the police, who found Phil's number in my phone under ice. And he or Cam have been by my side ever since. He told me about my injuries, of which there were many. As I was no longer in danger, Cam and Phil drove home, and a detective entered the room and introduced himself as Detective Graham Coles. He asked me how much I remembered about the attack. I told him everything, and he became especially interested when I told him about the message that the leader of the trio had left me. He was delighted when I told him that I had a DNA sample on my handkerchief, which he immediately placed in the evidence bag. When I finished, I closed my eyes for a moment, and when I opened them again, he was gone, and it was dark outside. The next day Phil came to see me and told me that when I was discharged I could stay at his house temporarily until I could walk again. I asked him to pick up the mail from my house and he said he would do it on the way home. I also asked if he knew a good divorce lawyer 
and he said he did and would contact her. We chatted for a bit and I fell asleep again. I was woken up by the nurse changing the bandages who said everything looked good and clean and there were no signs of infection. Soon after, the food arrived and it was quite difficult to eat with one hand, so the nurse had to cut my food. I slept well and woke up feeling rested. The nurse gave me a hygienic bath and no, I wasn't horny, I was still too sore. Phil came to see me with a beautiful woman whom he introduced as my new lawyer, Grace Miles. We discussed all the facts, and she confirmed that I still have visitation rights with my children and agreed to take my case, and then left. Phil handed me the mail he had collected and sat there while I looked through it. When I got to the DNA results, at first I was furious, but then I started laughing. Neither of the kids were mine, so Jen cheated on both me and Carl at the same time, what a bitch. When I stopped laughing, I explained to Phil what it meant, and he nearly burst out laughing. I called Grace and asked her to set up a meeting with Jen, Carl, and their lawyer at the hospital because I had a change of heart and wanted to discuss a settlement. She arranged a meeting in a rented office for the next day. Jen's face was priceless as Phil wheeled me into the office in a wheelchair with a cast on my arm and leg, tubes coming out of my body from Ives. My face was bruised, as was most of my body. Jen looked genuinely shocked by my appearance, but Carl just smirked. I looked at my opponents and spoke. Well, after the visit of your friends, I reconsidered my position. And don't even think about denying that you set this up, Carl. The last words of your thugs were, Sign these damn papers. Why would anyone else say that if you didn't send them? My lawyer prepared a new document for me to sign, allowing you to adopt the children, but without the $2 million fee. You see, my lawyer explained to me that your document looked like I was selling you children. This would open the door to charging me with human trafficking, since trafficking another person is illegal. But you get 10 points for your effort. I then handed the document to their lawyer, who took it, looking a little guilty, and I continued. My lawyer and I have prepared a new agreement for you to sign. Everything is laid out here. My lawyer gave the file to their lawyer and copies for Jen and Carl to read. I spoke again. As you can see, this agreement is as different from yours as chalk is from cheese. Let me walk you through it. First, I keep the house and everything in it including my wife's jewelry, my savings, my business, and both cars. She also transfers into my lawyer's account the entire amount held in her not-so-secret mercantile credit account approximately $18,000. You bastard, this is my money, I earned it, and you can't have it. My wife blurted out, she was bright red, with a pulsating vein in her neck. Carl looked at her strangely, apparently, he did not know about her secret account. Carl gently sat her back down in her chair, still grinning at me. Shut up, you cheating, conniving bitch, and sit quietly. Adults talk, and that doesn't include you. I saw everyone except Phil try to suppress a smile, and he chuckled quietly. Jen instantly turned gray, but remained silent. Before I was so rudely interrupted, I said that since she earns significantly more than me, she will also pay me spousal support in the amount of $2,500 a month out of my lawyer's account. As for the company you both work for, as compensation for ruining my marriage and causing me bodily harm, you will pay me $10 million net of taxes, also for my attorney's account, plus all of my medical bills, my legal fees, and the full cost of my post-operative care, which will be determined by my lawyer. All this must be paid by 17 o'clock Friday. Carl stood there laughing his head off. You're a fucking madman. Why should we pay you anything? We got what we wanted, so you can get lost. 20%. What? I said 20%. I heard you for the first time, but what does that mean? This is the estimated amount of revenue your company will lose in the first two years, following a lawsuit against you alleging complicity in the destruction of my marriage and the alienation of my children and wife. Did you just come up with this figure, or did you just make it all up? No, I did an in-depth analysis of your company's clients and how much they pay you. Everything is completely legal. Your company is public, so all the information is available on the website. 
think about the impact this will have on your father's campaign for Congress, since he is, after all, running on the slogan of family values. What about your customers' opinions? You have several politicians and celebrities on your PR account. One hint of scandal, and they will abandon ship. And as for your advertising agency, you have two children's clothing brands, a children's products company, and a sportswear manufacturer. All the high-profile companies, they will drop you like a hot potato. And when all this shit starts to unravel, there will be a board meeting, and you will find yourself on the edge. So ten million is a cheap way out. Carl suddenly stopped grinning and looked rather bad. My lawyer will give you the full amount, and it should be in her account by Friday at 5 p.m. No one said anything else, but I could see that Carl was still thinking about how to get out, so I continued. Oh, and Carl, if you think disappearing will help you, think again. I sent the whole story to five lawyers in other states, and if anything happens to me, they will send it to the media. It was clear from his face that I had hit the nail on the head in guessing his thoughts. Now he looked completely defeated. As we were leaving, I said over my shoulder, until Friday at 17 o'clock. When we returned to my room, Grace asked me why I gave in so easily and allowed Carl to adopt my children, although before that I was categorically against it. I gave her the DNA results for her to read. After reading them, she burst out laughing. You are a cunning bastard. The children are not yours. Whose are they? I don't know, but I intend to find out, because this proves that she cheated on both me and Carl at the same time. And when I find out, I will definitely tell Carl about it. Mark, I wouldn't want to get in your way. You should be a lawyer. You'd make an excellent lawyer. Thank you, but I don't have that killer instinct. In fact, you have it. You just haven't used it yet. Later that day, the doctor came to see me and told me that I could be discharged the next day if I could get help. Phil and Cam said I could move in with them temporarily, so that's what I did. I still had to go to the hospital twice a week for bandage changes and urine tests to make sure my kidney was healed. The time came for Friday, and I waited with bated breath until 5 in the evening, but I worried in vain. At 3.30 p.m. my lawyer called me, informing me that the money in the amount of $10,860,312 had been deposited into the account. Damn it, I was rich, or rather, richer than I was. Grace has already taken her share and transferred the balance to my checking account. Life went on. After eight weeks of love and care from my friends, I returned to my home, but I did not feel joy, I was lonely, and the house seemed empty and dull. I decided to move closer to the people I love most my sister. I came to work and called a meeting with May and Greg. I explained to them that I needed to start over far away from here, and they understood. I then thanked them for the great job they were doing and surprised them by transferring ownership of the business to them, including all the money that had been earned while I was away. I took them both to dinner and said goodbye. Next stop is my good friends Phil and Cam. I took them to dinner and presented them with a check for $500,000 for their care during my recovery. They tried to refuse, but I explained that Carl's company had to pay for my treatment, so it was his money, not mine, and they agreed. After dinner we sat with a glass of wine, and I told them that I was going to move to New York to live with my sister. Phil asked what I was going to do with the house. I said that perhaps I would take it. He looked a little embarrassed and started fidgeting, so I told him to speak up. He explained that his eldest son, Eric, had just completed his engineering degree and had found a job with a local company. Moreover, his girlfriend got pregnant and they are going to get married, but they have nowhere to live. They don't want to live with his parents for obvious reasons, so he asked if I would rent out my house to them. I was delighted. Not only would I help my friends, but I would also give a young couple a chance to start their life. I told Phil to set the rent based on what they could afford, and since I didn't need the money, they should put it in a savings account for their future child's education. Cam hugged me so tightly that I was sure she had broken my ribs again, and I saw tears in Phil's eyes. The next day I called Patty and explained what had happened and asked if I could stay with her until I found a place to live. 
she was delighted and began to make plans for what we would do. Three weeks later, I closed the door to my house for the last time and cried a little on the way to Phil's to drop off the keys. I also left pink paper for Jen's car and told Phil to give it to his son as a housewarming gift. We exchanged hugs and said goodbye with tears in our eyes, promising to keep in touch. I arrived at Patty's after a pleasant two-week car ride in no hurry, so I stopped whenever I wanted and stayed the night. Patty almost suffocated me in her arms, but let go when I said I couldn't breathe. She showed me to my room and said that we were going to dinner with a friend. It will be a casual dinner, so no need to dress up, pants and a shirt will do, and we will meet her friend there. We went to a nice cafe with waiters and a good bar. When we walked in, I realized it was a set-up Jen's sister, Amy, was waiting for us at the table. I was angry at first, but I could never stay angry at Patty for long, so I decided to just go with the flow. When we got to the table, Amy stood up and hugged Patty, and then, to my complete surprise, she hugged me, telling me what a bitch Jen was and that she hoped she burned in hell. Amy lived nearby and worked at an advertising agency in the accounting department. The evening went very well, and when we moved to the dance area, Amy was the first to drag me to dance. We danced two waltzes and one slow dance, and then returned to smiling Patty. You two looked so good together on the dance floor as a couple, Patty said. Amy blushed, and I hastened to retreat to the toilet. I danced with Amy and Patty for the rest of the evening, but avoided slow dancing. At the end of the evening, we put Amy in a taxi and called another one for us. When we got home, I chided Patty for setting me up, but she just laughed and went to bed. The next day we went to look for a house for me. I didn't want an apartment I was used to living in a house, and I liked working in the yard and mowing the lawn. This would also come in handy for hosting barbecues or parties or just inviting friends over when they show up. I couldn't believe the prices of houses, but we were in the suburbs of New York, so I had to pay a pretty penny for what I wanted. After several weeks of searching, I chose a small three-room house with a kitchen dining room and a separate living room. It also had a fairly large backyard and front lawn, but what really sold me was that the house was in a gated community with one entry and exit through security. The village had a good swimming pool, gym, and playground for families with children, and even had its own nanny service. Patty was delighted and joked that she wanted to move in with me. Before moving, I needed to furnish and decorate the house and buy everything I needed, towels, pots and pans, etc. I was lucky that I already had all the kitchen appliances in the house, but I needed to stock up on groceries and other essentials. Amy and Patty were wonderful in helping me choose what I wanted, and they made the house look more feminine and feel more cozy than a bachelor cave. I set up one room as an office with the best computer and an operating system of my own design, a work desk, several cabinets, and, of course, a fireproof safe. Patty and Amy talked me into having a housewarming party. Since I didn't know anyone here, the house was filled with friends Patty and Amy. I think the idea was to introduce me to new people. It worked, and I now appeared on several people's phones and on their social media friend lists. The next few weeks were filled with parties and barbecues almost every weekend. I understand that I was enjoying my new popularity and didn't think much about Jen. During this time, Amy and I became closer and became more than just friends, but not yet lovers. One evening, I was supposed to take Amy and Patty to the theater, but Patty canceled at the last minute, citing stomach pain, so Amy and I went alone. As we sat watching The Taming of the Shrew, Amy suddenly took my hand. This took me by surprise, since the most we had exchanged before was kisses on the cheek. After the show, we took a taxi to Amy's house, and as I walked her to the door, the taxi drove off. I cursed because it was almost impossible to get a taxi in this area. Amy just laughed and said it wasn't funny, and I would have to walk over two miles home. She replied, in that case, you'd better stay the night. Then she pulled my head towards her and kissed me with the most sensual kiss I had ever experienced. Taking my hand, she led me to the door of her apartment and pulled me inside. She immediately started kissing me as soon as we entered the bedroom. I stood in the middle of the room, slightly dumbfounded, when she said, 
What does a girl have to do to sleep with you? I waited so long that I decided to take the first step myself. She started to undress, and my little friend was no longer small, so I followed her example. She lost consciousness, and I lay there holding her until she came to. She looked into my eyes. What did you do to me? This is the first time this has happened to me. My sister must have been crazy to give up on you, but thank God she did. I will never let you go, or maybe I will never let you out of this bed. Damn, I'm exhausted. We lay in each other's arms, regaining our strength, and began to kiss with renewed passion. We lay naked on the bed, hugging each other, until we woke up in the morning. We quickly ran to the bathroom and repeated everything again, and then fell asleep again. We finally woke up at 1 p.m. and realized we needed food more than we needed more sex. We went to a local delicatessen and ordered lunch and coffee. After lunch, we went back to Amy's apartment and discussed what had happened. Amy said that she liked me from the first time we met and that she was jealous of her sister. When we broke up, she admitted it to Patty and asked her to help bring us together. Patty was delighted, of course, and said she was sure I would be interested once I forgot Jen. I said I was interested as soon as I saw her at Patty's when I arrived, but I didn't think it would be very appropriate if I started flirting with my wife's sister. I didn't want you to think it was just a rebound, so I kept my distance. Amy said she understood and was grateful that I considered her feelings before making the move, but she couldn't wait any longer, so she and Patty arranged this meeting. We both laughed about it for a long time, and then Amy sent Patty a message. Mission accomplished. I still wore my clothes from last night and needed to change, so Amy drove me home. Amy was nothing like her sister, and I felt completely comfortable with her. There was no feeling that she could explode at any moment over a trifle and start a quarrel. We were just perfect for each other, and Patty talked about it several times and was happy for us. In the meantime, I continued to work on my project, and finally it was ready. The beauty of this program and equipment was its versatility. They could be adapted for military, gaming, aviation both commercial and light, and even automotive applications. I decided to contact one of the leading game manufacturers because I was confident that thorough testing by gamers would reveal any bugs. When I approached a gaming company, they were somewhat skeptical about my proposal, believing that they already had the best programmers in the world. After demonstrating my new approach, they asked for a three-month trial period, which I agreed to, providing them with a sealed unit and tamper-proof software. At the end of the probationary period, they invited me to a meeting to discuss next steps. I came with my sister, a corporate lawyer, and her colleague who specializes in this type of negotiation. Games wanted to buy the patents from me, and offered a generous $120 million, knowing that they could sell them and make a profit of five times that amount from worldwide game sales. I refused, stating that I would only sell production rights under a 10-year license and wanted $50 million and 1% royalties on all applications using my hardware and software for the same period. After several hours of negotiations, we came to a compromise, $65 million and 0.5% over 10 years. Contracts were drawn up, signed, and the deal was sealed with a handshake. Now I'm a very rich man even after taxes, but I'm not done. I have negotiated similar deals with a leading military aircraft supplier, civil aviation, and even a major automaker. In monetary terms, I was now worth over $250 million after taxes, and the 10-year projection put my net worth at over $3.5 billion. I could hardly comprehend the wealth I now had and received advice on how to invest it. Conservatively, if I had simply left the money in the bank, the pre-tax interest income would have been over $12 million per year. Amy and I were now living together, and she was renting out her apartment. My sister Patty was dating another lawyer, and they were starting to get serious. It had been just over a year since I left to start a new life, and I felt it was time to get revenge on the two people who had caused me so much pain. I sat down with Amy and explained that I still wanted to get back at her sister and asked if she would mind. She replied, Burn this bitch, and if I can help with anything, just tell me.
we sat and planned all sorts of scenarios, but in the end we decided to wait a little before taking revenge. We had just finished dinner when the phone rang. It was an assistant district attorney from Freestone, Texas. They caught the people who attacked me and wanted me to testify in three weeks. I, of course, agreed. When the time came, Amy insisted on coming with me, so we decided to make it a short vacation and arrive a week before the trial. We flew 1,600 miles to Texas and Phil picked us up from the airport and took us to our hotel. As a thank you, we took Phil and Cam to dinner at the Regency Club restaurant. Cam and Amy looked stunning in their cocktail dresses, outshining Phil and me. Phil was wearing his best suit to go to church, and I was wearing my new $2,000 custom Italian suit. Together we looked like wealthy tourists. Neither of us had ever been to this restaurant before, as we couldn't afford it before I suddenly became rich. We arrived in a limousine, and a uniformed doorman opened the car doors for us, and then the front doors of the restaurant. When we entered, the maitre de hotel came up to us and escorted us to our seats. Soft music was playing on the piano, and Cam and Phil's faces were filled with anticipation of a great evening. We ordered a light melon appetizer with Parma ham, sliced so thinly that it became almost transparent. Then, each of us chose a main course of his choice, followed by a fruit salad for dessert, all accompanied by a strong red and dessert white wine. As we were finishing our meal and looking forward to hitting the dance floor, I looked around the restaurant and noticed Jen and her husband Carl at the other end of the room with another couple. I pointed them out to everyone. Amy said she needed to go to the ladies' room and stood up, followed by Cam. Of course, on the way to the ladies' room they had to pass Jen and company's table. I saw Amy stop and say hello to Jen and point to Phil and me. Jen's face became as if she had seen a ghost and she covered her mouth with her hand. Amy told her something else, which made Cam laugh and walk away. Jen stood up and ran out of the restaurant, and Carl followed her. When the girls returned, I asked what Amy said to cause this reaction. Cam explained that after greeting Jen, asked who she was with, and Amy replied, I'm with the other millionaire sitting over there, and pointed at me, then added, I have to thank you for leaving your husband. We were made for each other. I just don't understand what you see in this pompous monkey. You clearly took a step back and walked away. We spent the rest of the evening dancing and laughing about how Amy met her sister. Cam and Phil had to work, so Amy and I did touristy things and saw the sights. We even spent a day at the shooting range shooting different types of guns. I was surprised that Amy turned out to be an excellent shot, much better than me. In the evening we went out for dinner and danced a lot. The day before the trial we went to Phil and Cam's for dinner, and I have to say, homemade food doesn't compare to restaurant food. After dinner Phil told us the news that his son was going to marry his fiancée in the spring, and we all toasted their wedding. We had a meeting with the assistant district attorney before the trial, and he said that the case would be won without difficulty. They caught the leader of the trio because I provided them with his DNA. It turned out that he had a long record of violence and this was his third crime, so he agreed to hand over his two accomplices, who were also under arrest. Their trial will be after his, and with his testimony they will go to jail for a long time. He also said that the one I hit in the throat is still wheezing like a frog because I damaged his vocal cords. But the bad news was that none of the three were ready to blame Carl Prescott. The assistant district attorney thinks Prescott paid them to keep quiet, and no one wants to anger his congressman father by accusing his son of plotting murder. We attended all three trials, and I was pleased with the outcome. The leader received a reduced sentence of 15 years for ratting out his accomplices. The one I punched in the throat only got two years because he didn't actually take part in the attack, and the other got five years because it was his first crime. Phil and Cam drove us to the airport, and as we said goodbye, I gave Phil an envelope and told him not to open it until we took off. Inside were deeds to my old house, a wedding gift for his son. I made sure that they were registered only in the name of his son, since I knew how fragile marriage vows are. When we got home and unpacked, I went into my office and called my sister, inviting them to dinner on Friday without telling Amy. 
Friday came, and I told Amy that we were going to dinner with Patty and her friend. Amy was delighted, and that evening a limousine picked us up and took us to a very fancy restaurant that I had booked three weeks before. As we sipped wine after a very filling dinner, a man dressed as a gypsy came to our table with a violin and began playing a gypsy love song. The entire restaurant watched as I got down on one knee and proposed to Amy. The look on her face was priceless as she said yes through tears of joy, and there was thunderous applause from the entire restaurant. Patty walked up to the table, hugged Amy, and said, Welcome to the family. We danced all night before the limousine took us home. The wedding was scheduled for early spring and invitations were sent out. I wisely stayed out of the preparation and let Amy and Patty take the lead. We got married in a local church, and I covered all expenses for out-of-town guests by renting an entire floor of the Hilton Hotel for three days. The wedding was a luxurious event, and everyone was happy. Phil and Cam said they haven't had this much fun in years and invited us to their son's wedding in two months. Amy and I went on a two-week cruise to the Caribbean, and after nights of dancing and daytime excursions, we came back exhausted and in need of some more relaxation. I created a troubleshooting team to manage any problems that might arise with my new program and hardware, so I had very little to do. So I got busy with the plan planning the next stage of his revenge. I was playing the long game, so I took my time. Nine months after our return our son James was born, and a year later his sister Sarah. We moved to a bigger house, but still in a gated community. By then I was very rich and had become almost a celebrity, attending various charity events where I donated generously. Amy and I even appeared in some society magazines and were called the perfect couple. As time passed, I never forgot my revenge. What they had done and tried to do to me still hurt. Almost nine years have passed since my ex-wife left to take a step-up time for the first stage. Over the past five years, I've hired a detective agency to gather information about Jen and Carl, as well as those who were close to them, especially her former boss, Troy Simmons. I especially needed Troy's DNA profile as I suspected he was the father of Jen's twins. Detectives found interesting facts. 1. The twins were indeed Troy's children, as I suspected. 2. Jen continued to date Troy for sex on the side, as well as two other men. 3. Carl slept with his assistant and various easily accessible girls when he was on the road. I launched the first part of my plan. I sent Carl a copy of the twins and Troy's DNA tests with a note, You are infertile. Mark's DNA doesn't match, but Troy Simmons' DNA does. Draw your own conclusions. From this information, it was clear that the twins were not mine, which meant Jen must have slept with Troy while she slept with Carl. In other words, she cheated on both me and Carl at the same time. I also sent Carl copies of her current novels to sweeten the pill. Then I sat back and waited for the shit to hit the fan. Phil called me about two months later and told me that Carl had kicked Jen out, using their prenup to keep the kids since he had adopted them. She left with nothing, and no one knew where she went. Amy called her parents to see if they knew anything. Her father said he sent Jen a couple thousand dollars and told her not to call him again. The first stage is completed. Now she knew what it was like to be betrayed and lose her children. It looked like she still had her laptop, as her email was active. I decided to add a little fuel to the fire and sent her a detective agency report about Carl and several photographs of him with girls for money and mistresses. This was bound to cause some turmoil in the divorce process. A few days later, Amy and I were sitting watching an old movie when the gate intercom rang. The guard on duty asked if a certain Mrs. Prescott could come to our house. I asked him to wait a minute so I could ask Amy. She looked as puzzled as I did, but said, let's hear what she has to say. I told the guard to let her through. A few minutes later, there was a knock on the door. Amy opened the door and standing in front of her was what could only be described as a wreck. Her hair looked like it hadn't been brushed in days, there wasn't an ounce of makeup on her face, and her clothes looked like they'd been slept in. Amy invited her in, and when she did, I noticed that she couldn't look me in the eyes. Amy offered her coffee, and she gratefully accepted. 
Jen sat across from me, but still couldn't look at me, so I opened up the conversation. I was still very angry at her, but part of me felt sorry for this ruined being in front of me, a ruined being that I, too, had a hand in creating, and it made me feel guilty until I remembered what she had done to me. You look like shit tied with rope. What happened to you? This completely broke her. She burst into tears, and we couldn't get a word out of her for the next ten minutes. Finally, through tears, she began to say, Somehow he found out that the twins were not yours, and that I had been dating Troy all this time. It wasn't hard for him to guess that I had seen Troy after Carl, and I got married. He got mad and kicked me out, leaving me in only what I was wearing. All I had left were my car keys and my laptop in the car and a couple thousand in my account, so I got a motel room, but no one wanted to talk to me after what I did to you. I had no friends and my family turned their backs on me. I called Barry, Carl's father, and he said that now he had an heir for the family and I was no longer needed. I called my dad and he finally agreed to talk to me and wired me a couple thousand, but told me not to call again. I had nowhere to go, so I spent the last of my money to come here, hoping Amy would take pity on me. I knew that you wouldn't save me even if I was burning, and I didn't count on your help. If this means anything, I really am very sorry for what I did, I was selfish and cruel, and I deserve my fate, but I miss my children and want them back. I was a lousy wife, but I was a really good mother. She finished her carefully prepared speech and looked at us like a beaten dog. Although I knew she was rehearsing her speech, there was truth in her words, and despite myself, I felt sorry for her. In addition, I hated Carl, since he was the organizer of my suffering, and his time was coming to an end. I also owed him a beating, but that could wait. Amy asked Jen if she was hungry, and she replied that she hadn't eaten in two days. Amy made her bacon, eggs, and hash browns, followed by pancakes with syrup. She ate greedily and asked for more coffee, which Amy poured for her. Amy then showed her to the guest room so she could shower. While Jen was in the shower, Amy found clothes that fit her and left them on the bed. While Jen showered and got dressed, Amy and I discussed what to do with our uninvited guest. Amy said that even though she doesn't love Jen, Jen is still her sister and she feels obligated to help. I agreed, but only if it would make Carl angry, seeing that Jen was back on her feet. We agreed that Jen would stay in the guest bedroom until we could make other arrangements, and Amy would take her shopping to Walmart tomorrow. Jen came back downstairs looking much refreshed, and we gave her the good news about her situation. She started crying again. Soon after that we all went to bed. Amy and I sat and talked late into the night and made some decisions that we hoped would help unravel this tangle. I was used to getting up early and working out at the gym and pool for about an hour, but Jen beat me to it and had already prepared coffee and toast. Amy was already sitting at the table eating, so I joined her and Jen sat with us. Mark, I really didn't expect such a warm welcome. I'm so grateful that I don't know what to say. Jen, what you did was unforgivable, as you now understand, having lost your family. I think you've finally realized how much you hurt me, but thanks to Amy and the love we share, I think I can finally forgive you. I will never forget what you did, but I don't want to think about it anymore, and I don't want you to continue to apologize. This stage is closed, and a new one has begun. I want you to go shopping with Amy this morning while I try to find you a place to stay. For now it's Walmart for essentials, but we'll find better clothes later. Well, now I'll go to the gym, see you later. When I got home, the girls had already left and the kids were at school, so I started looking for a place to live for Jen. I called the housing inspector at our gated community and he said they had a one-room house available just two streets away. I went to look at it and was surprised to find it fully furnished and ready to move into. The owner was an army officer who had been posted to Europe for three years and wanted to rent out his home. After the inspection, I paid a year's rent in advance, as well as a deposit for possible damage. When the girls returned home with enough clothes for Oxfam, I told them the good news. Amy just smiled and blew me a kiss, and Jen hugged me and thanked me through her tears. Then she looked at me and said, 
I don't know what I was thinking when I destroyed our marriage. I must have been hit by a Martian bitch beam. I should never have let you go. Amy, please take care of him. You will never find a better person. I know I won't. After that, she ran upstairs to hide her tears. While we were alone, I told Amy about my plans to help Jen and destroy Carl and his father. We spent the next day shopping for Jen to furnish her new home. We loaded up Amy's car and had the rest delivered. We decided to support Jen financially so she could feel independent. We gave her $10,000 to deposit into a checking account and a credit card with a $1,000 monthly limit. She cried again and hugged everyone. That night in bed, Amy said she was proud of me for not hitting Jen when she was in such a bad state and for being understanding. I just hoped Jen had learned her lesson and would treat her next man better. The next day, we all went to Jen's house together to help her settle in. Jen insisted on doing all the cleaning herself and started cleaning from ceiling to floor, even though it wasn't really necessary. She then insisted on inviting us all to dinner that night, as she wanted to cook something special for us. We left the children with the nanny and walked for ten minutes to her house. She sat us down at the table and set before us a magnificent dish beef top, baked potatoes, and assorted vegetables including one of my favorites thinly sliced green beans with carrots and parsnips, topped with garlic butter and honey, wrapped in foil, and baked in the oven for 25 minutes. Dessert was a baked apple stuffed with raisins and served with ice cream. We left, having eaten enough. Jen spent the next few weeks settling into her new home. Amy and I decided to help Jen with her divorce, and I made an appointment with the lawyer Patty recommended. I arrived on time, and he introduced himself as Brian Scott. I explained Jen's problem to him, and although he was not impressed with how she dealt with me, he agreed to take the case. We weren't worried about the financial side of things. Our main concern was getting the children back. I said I had an idea and explained that I had given Carl permission to adopt the children. When Brian said that this could be a serious obstacle, I asked, what if the children weren't mine to begin with? I explained that I was offered $2 million for the children, but I refused and gave permission for the adoption without financial gain, and then demanded $10 million as compensation for alienating the love of both Carl and Zai's advertising. They agreed to this so they wouldn't mention Zai's in the divorce process, and I signed a non-disclosure agreement. If I break the agreement, I will have to return the money. Brian asked if I could prove that the children were not mine, and I gave him the DNA results, which confirmed that the sperm belonged to Troy Simmons. Thus, the adoption was illegal, and Carl had no right to the children, and Jen could return them to herself. Brian said he would look into it and get back to me. That night, I told Amy what I had done, and she was completely supportive, so we asked Jen to come over. When Jen came in, she looked a little worried until I explained what I was doing. She threw herself into my arms and thanked me enthusiastically. Then she realized what she had done and stepped back, covering her mouth with tears in her eyes and apologizing. We both said at the same time, don't worry about it, and left it at that. A few days later, Brian contacted me and asked me to come to his office and bring Jen, since he would be representing her interests, not mine. The three of us went to him, and he outlined his plan. One, he will file a petition to annul the adoption. 2. He will contact the district attorney's office to report that Carl Prescott and his father Barry Prescott tried to buy two children in violation of the Anti-Slavery Act of 1865, thereby breaking the law. 3. In connection with the above crime, they pressured Mr. Mark Adams to allow them to adopt two children. Therefore, the subsequent adoption was effectively void because the two children were not Mr. Adams' children, and he could not have consented to it. The attached DNA certificates confirm this fact. 4. Mrs. Prescott therefore demands the immediate return of her children, who are currently being held at 218 against her will. 5. He will begin legal proceedings for Mrs. Prescott against Mr. Troy Simmons for sexual favors, alleging that he coerced the then Mrs. Adams into an affair so she would not lose her job. 6. He will begin legal proceedings for Mrs. Prescott against Mr. Carl Prescott, 
alleging that he coerced Mrs. Adams into sexual relations and ultimately forced her to leave her husband, Mr. Mark Adams, thereby destroying her marriage. 7. He will file a lawsuit against Zai's advertising on behalf of Mrs. Prescott for allowing the sexual relationship to occur and even encouraging the affair with knowledge of it. Because the CEO of the company, Mr. Carl Prescott, and the chairman of the board of the company, Mr. Barry Prescott, were aware of and even encouraged this affair and the destruction of her marriage. 8. He will file an action on behalf of Mr. Mark Adams against Mr. Troy Simmons for alienation of affections, which contributed to the destruction of his marriage to Mrs. Jennifer Adams. 9. He will file a lawsuit against Mr. Carl Prescott for alienation of affections and the eventual destruction of his marriage. 10. He will file a claim against Zai's advertising on behalf of Mr. Adams for failing to enforce his own moral clause in his employees' contracts. The company knew that Mr. Simmons was having an affair with Mrs. Adams, but took no action against them. 11. He will file a claim on behalf of Mr. Adams against Zai's advertising for failing to enforce the moral clause in the employee contract and for encouraging an affair between Mr. Carl Prescott and Mrs. Adams, resulting in the destruction of Mr. and Mrs. Adams' marriage. 12. Mr. Mark Adams admits that he signed a non-disclosure agreement in the amount of $10 million, and if he does not fulfill his obligations, he will have to return the specified amount. Mr. Adams is ready to fulfill his obligations and return the amount of $10 million according to the agreement. After we looked at Brian's proposal to fight not only Zai's advertising, but also Troy, Carl, and his father Barry, all three of us were stunned. This was much more revenge than I could have imagined. I explained to Jen that when this shit starts, she's going to get her share, so she needs to be prepared. She accepted her role in bringing this on herself and was willing to bear the consequences. I told Brian to get started as soon as possible and that I would expose his eyes to the media, launching a multi-pronged attack aimed primarily at Troy Simmons, Carl Prescott, Barry Prescott, and finally Zai's advertising. Brian said he would be ready to start in two weeks, and I would release my attack a week after that. During this time, Brian will try to cancel the adoption and return Jen's children. We left Brian's office with renewed hope, and I finally felt like I would soon get justice for the way I was treated. Brian did try to get the kids back, but Carl and Barry hired an army of lawyers to fight the case. During the second week of the trial, Brian began the rest of the proceedings. As agreed, a week later I sent all the collected materials to all possible media outlets. This sped up the proceedings. As soon as the media smelled blood, they rushed to the loot and set up camp at the courthouse and all three residences of the individuals mentioned. As I predicted, a ton of Zai's PR and advertising clients either canceled their contracts or threatened to do so. This prompted an emergency meeting of Zai's board of directors, where Troy Simmons was fired without severance pay. Carl and Barry Prescott were forced to resign in an attempt to stop the exodus of their prestigious clients. They also agreed to pay seven figures to both Jen and me. Combined with the expected settlement from my other claims, I would more than make up for the $10 million I would have to pay back for violating my NDA. Something good came out of this crap for the American people. Congressman Barry Prescott was forced to resign due to failing health because his campaign was based on family values. Shortly after his resignation, irregularities in the use of campaign funds were discovered, such as spending on cruise vacations and hiring girls for sex during the campaign. He was called to a hearing before a select committee to provide explanations, and the FBI also expressed interest. Less than a month after my disclosure to the media, all claims were settled and Jen's children were returned to her. Shortly after their return, Amy and I took Jen and the children to her parents to reconcile all parties. I explained to her parents that I had forgiven her and that now, if we were not friends, we were at least on friendly terms and that I wanted them to forgive her too. The fact that they were seeing their grandchildren for the first time also helped. Barry Prescott was convicted of fraudulent use of campaign funds and served a three-year prison sentence. I finally got my revenge on Carl Prescott.
he was also found guilty of embezzling company funds. Two offshore accounts were found with large sums transferred there from his work computer. He received five years in federal prison. He would only get three years, but he refused to say where the rest of the missing funds were. My final revenge for the attack on me was that I bribed the prison guard to be housed with a very unpleasant man, lovying male society. Jen moved into a larger home and retook the bar exam, joining the same law firm as Patty. We sometimes babysat each other's children, but did not communicate. Until now, Jen has not dated anyone, completely immersed in work and raising children. Subscribe to our channel so that your love doesn't cheat on you, and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think click to the next one. Click to the next one. Click to the next one. Click to the next one.